The week before last, I used the first couple of verses of Acts 2 to look at who the Holy Spirit is and go into a bit more detail. Of course, you know, he is, he is God and there's no way we can cover everything about him in one 40 or 50 minute message. But I tried uh, to take us to some of the most important aspects of who the Holy Spirit is. And so today I'm actually going to go into chapter 2 proper and um, see what um, we, can, we can learn from chapter 2. Okay, so I'm going to start reading Acts 2, uh, starting at verse 1, and then, you know, we'll stop and just keep going um, as the Lord leads. So, Acts 2, chapter, um, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, before going, I'm going to read an excerpt from Warren Wearsby's commentary on what the Pentecost is. And I think it gives us a, um, a greater appreciation for what is then about to happen. So Warren Wearsby writes this, Pentecost means 50th because this feast was held 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. This is out of Leviticus 23, 15 through 22. The calendar of Jewish feasts in Leviticus 23 is an outline of the work of Jesus Christ. Passover pictures his death as the Lamb of God, and the Feast of First Fruits picture his resurrection from the dead. Fifty days after First Fruits is the Feast of Pentecost, which pictures the formation of the church. At Pentecost, the Jews celebrated the giving of the law, but Christians celebrated because of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. The Feast of First Fruits took place on the day after the Sabbath following Passover, which means it was always on the first day of the week. The Sabbath, a Sabbath is the seventh day. Jesus ro arose from the dead on the first day of the week and became the first fruits of them that slept, which is 1 Corinthians 15.20. Now, if Pentecost was 50 days later, seven weeks plus one day, then Pentecost also took place on the first day of the week. Now listen. Christians assemble and worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, because on that day our Lord arose from the dead, but it was also the day on which the Holy Spirit was given to the church. I thought that was just an interesting way to look at it, and um, I just wanted to share that with you. Okay, so moving on. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they res rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So we see the Holy Spirit coming down. Now what happened at Pentecost the way the Holy Spirit came down is not the normal way that he does things. This was the first time that he was now going to come down after the resurrection of Christ. So if someone tells us that this is what needs to happen and this is how the only way it happens, that's not true. That Holy Spirit coming down, that incident is a very special incident. And it's not, as far as I know, it's not been repeated since. Now, when we place our trust and faith in Jesus, he just comes. There's no, you know, hoopla and there's no, you know, uh, voice and no. Now, granted, if the Lord wants that to happen, he could, but it's, he just, he's just, is there. Okay. There's no drama, no theatrics. He's just there. Okay. This was because it was the first time and um, it became a very supernatural event because that's what the believers needed at the time. So the Holy Spirit comes down on each person. The tongues of fire. What, what does the tongues of fire signify? Well, it's very simple. It's the witness that the church would be to all people. That's what it is. The Holy Spirit is, you know, powerful. He's active. Um, in fact, I can tell you that James 3, 5 through 6. Oh, hey, where is it? Sorry. James 3, 5 through 6 says this, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. This is human tongue. But then 
The Holy Spirit comes in tongues of fire saying, no, it's no longer going to be our tongue. It's going to be the Holy Spirit who is going to spread the gospel through us, but not using human tongues. He's going to speak first off to us and then through us, and it's going to be like a fire. Okay, but the fire in this case is not the fire by hell. It's going to be the word of God powerfully working in the lives of others, drawing them to Jesus. So it says this, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, I have actually been in a church where the pastor and, you know, many people within the church insisted that this was a divine language. Um, for those of us who have been in churches where tongues are spoken uh, en masse, you will know what I'm talking about. It doesn't sound like any language, a uh, human language. It just sounds often like a repetition. I've been around people. I've been in prayer circles where like a light switch going on, all of them suddenly speak in their own tongues. But listening closely, I hear repetition. The same phrases being repeated. Okay. That's not what this tongues is. No matter what anyone says, it's not because it's my opinion and I just don't like the gobbledygook that I hear from other people when they are praying in tongues. It's because the text says, it, the text gives us proof of what these other tongues are. Because going on, it says this. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem. This is verse 5. Devout men from every nation under heaven. So the crowd that is listening to this noise being made is Jews, okay? And it says this, And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them, as in the disciples who had the tongues land on them, hearing them speak in his own language. See, we use scripture to explain scripture. If I were to just say, take to speak with other tongues and run off with it, I could make it into anything that I like. But you read just one or two verses further, and we know that all the Jews in the, in the surrounding area clearly heard this supernatural event taking place, and they see all these people just speaking in a language that each one of them could understand. Meaning, all of a sudden, if uh, the tongue had come on Justin, for instance, and he began to speak through the power of the Holy Spirit, he began to speak in Hindi or Malayalam, which is my language, and I could understand him. Guess what? It's a foreign tongue to him and to pretty much everybody else sitting here. But I could understand it, and that's exactly what was happening here. So the Holy Spirit gives utterance of other tongues. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just because it happened in this instance at the first coming of the Holy Spirit does not somehow make it the greatest gift and the sign of salvation as some people have insisted. Again, I've been in churches where that's been the case. That is not true. Again, if we were to take this as the supernatural one-off event as it is meant to be, then we would be able to use the rest of the scripture and not somehow put the speaking of tongues so high up that that is a sign of salvation. I know people who do that and their conduct and their character are far from what a Christian should be. So no, the tongues is not necessarily the sign of salvation. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives utterance of other tongues. So we each hear them in our own language to which we were born. They were hearing. What were they hearing? We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. Continuing on. They were amazed and astonished saying, verse 7, Why are not, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Wait a second. These are Galileans. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born, as in my mother tongue? I'm listening to something that they should not be able to speak. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Bo Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Proselytes, sorry. 
Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's verse 11. So everyone is hearing all these disciples. It must have been to the un trained ear it would have been pandemonium can you imagine if we were a hundred 120 is the number of disciples gathered 120 people were speaking in 120 different languages at the same time but guess what all of them heard the mighty deeds of God being preached it didn't matter how many there were it didn't matter how loud it was God was at work through the Holy Spirit and God's word will not return void. And that's exactly what was happening there. Verse 12 says, And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. Okay, so speaking, uh, you know, speaking in tongues today, and I'll I'll share some more verses um, here with you. Speaking of speaking in tongues is a very divisive thing in churches today. It is okay. It is one of the most divisive things. Romans eight twenty six through twenty seven says, "Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought." But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Sometimes when we don't know what to pray, we don't, the words don't even come out, but the Holy Spirit intercedes. There are those who have taken this and said the moanings and the groanings can then be used as the justification for all of that. What happens in private? between a person and between God is between them and God. Are are there divine tongues that people speak? Yeah, there are. And I have been in churches where there have been tongues spoken that we have no clue. There's nobody who could interpret the language. But guess what? In my heart, I was going and many others were going, okay, Lord, if it is from you, someone's going to stand up in the next 30 seconds and go, this is what was said. And just to confirm, three people stood up and said the same thing. So it works, of course, because the Holy Spirit is around today. The speaking of tongues, um, we've made it into this uh, circus show in many occasions, but it really happens. And when God is doing it through a person, God will also give the gift of interpretation to somebody to edify the church. In private, of course, it is between the spirit that is in the person and, of course, God. And that is not our business. And that is between that person and God. What else when it comes to speaking of tongues? In 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 5, it says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. This is the private stuff. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. We see this. Paul saying, hey, I I would prefer that all of you spoke in tongues, but prophesying is greater because that edifies the church. But then he says, but if you do speak in a tongue, well, if someone interprets it, that's good for the edification of the church. If somebody here began to speak in tongues, I want to be like, oh, be quiet. Because I would wait for the Lord to speak to somebody else so that that person can interpret, so that we'll all be edified. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 19. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. This is Paul saying, clearly he spoke in some divine tongue. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding as in God giving him the understanding, that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So for anyone, you know, those Christians who say, no, it's okay for everybody to just stand up and do whatever in a church service, it contradicts what Paul's talking about here. He says, I would much rather speak five intelligible words that edifies everybody than 10,000 words in a tongue if no one's interpreting it. Okay? Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 28. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Very interesting this. Because look, he's, Paul's saying, 
If there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church. Very interesting. How can Paul say that? So does that mean that after the fact he's going to keep silent? No. If the Holy Spirit is going to give you divine utterance, chances are he's going to say, I'm also giving the interpretation to somebody. But if it is meant to be a private conversation with that person and God, let him speak to himself and to God. He says, make it personal, make it private. Don't say it out in church because the Holy Spirit is not putting that for the rest of the church. Speaking in tongues is obviously a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is alive today, but the scriptures are very clear as to how we exercise that gift if we have that gift. Okay, look, I don't have that gift. I'd like to, because I'd like to experience what that is. And I've been in churches where somebody was, you know, almost like trying to give me the gift. Like, you know, come on, speak and speak, speak. It was very awkward. I had gone up wanting that, sincerely desiring that. But, you know, that person was putting pressure on me to speak in a different language, almost out of peer pressure, go into gobbledygook. And I refused to. Because that's not how the Holy Spirit works. And there are churches like that today. Okay, That's not what we do. That's not what uh, the Lord tells us to do. That's not what Paul was te- uh, God was teaching through Paul. We know better because we have the Word of God. Okay, So that's speaking in tongues today. Now, the uh, Greek word for gloss- glossalia or glossae is the root word that's used there in tongues is a language or nation identified by their language. Again, further evidence that the word used there is a language that may be foreign to us, but not foreign to the native speaker of that language. So verse 13 says, But others were mocking and saying they were full of sweet wine. I only single that out for the simple reason that today when we exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not just speaking in tongues, if someone, if, if the Holy Spirit tells us to go speak to somebody, okay, he prompts us and we go and say, oh, hello, well, why are you saying hello to me? Why are you saying this to me? Well, I believe the Spirit prompted me to say that. Now, Christian or non-Christian, they might turn around and go, what are you on about? Are you crazy? Are you hearing voices? It can happen. It may have happened to some of you. But what I'm trying to say is there will always be mockers. As long as we are down here and we're not up there with him, there will always be somebody who mocks us because we are led by the Spirit. Okay. So, moving on. So that's what, that's what they said. They were full of sweet wine. Now, but Peter, starting at verse 14, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day, nine in the morning. Okay, they're not drunkards. It's nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs of the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Peter starts, stands up in the strength of the Spirit and he is about to tell them a few things. First, he tells them what's happened. He says, they're not drunk. In fact, what you're seeing is part of the prophecy. Part, I say, of the prophecy of Joel being fulfilled. And this is Joel 28 through 32. It's not a fulfillment of all of it. Because starting at verse 19 in Acts 2, he talks about great wonders in the sky above, blood and and signs on the earth below. And that is the second coming. Now he's talking about the end times towards the end of the reign. Okay, so we know that it's part of the prophecy. So Peter is now talking about what's happened. Hey, it is God's word being fulfilled. That's what you're hearing. 
But then he goes on to explain, starting at verse 22 of Acts 2. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So, he explains the person of Christ. Okay? And he tells them, not in just theological terms, he makes it very personal. You saw this Christ performing miracles. He was in your midst. He was attested by God to be a prophet, to be a great teacher. You were all witness to this. And he makes it very personal because it was. They were witness to this. And throughout the ministry of Jesus, we know that a lot of people acknowledge him as a prophet and sent by God, a great teacher. Because they saw it firsthand. Sure, not all of them may have believed, but they saw it with their own eyes. And Peter, you know, God speaking through Peter makes it very personal. Then he goes into the prophecy of David. So to further, you know, strengthen the position of Christ, he goes, For David says of him, starting at verse 25, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for He is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then he goes on to say, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on, this thro- on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, and he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. I mean, Peter is going very methodically, talking about who Jesus is, what's happened, and the fact that David speaks of the resurrection of Christ, and who, why Christ is greater than David. Okay, so the, the, psalm, um, the prophecy of David that he, we are reading here is actually out of Psalm 16, 8 through 11. So we we look at the person of Christ, we look at the prophecy of David, this is Peter going through, the witness of the believers, he's saying, we saw this, we are attesting to the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay, so he's going, he's, he's like, you saw him, David speaks of him, we saw him after he was crucified and he rose again, and then finally, It's the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is what they are experiencing. So the how it happened, this is almost a chronology of events. So Peter, it's not because Peter had all weekend to prepare a wonderful sermon. This is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter stood up and spoke exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted him to speak so that it would speak to the hearts of the people who were there listening. So Psalm uh, 110.1, you know, talks about David died and he's buried, but Jesus didn't decay. He's alive, he ascended, and he's at the right hand of God, of God, and therefore he has sent the Holy Spirit as he promised. So if Jesus remained dead, his promise of sending the Holy Spirit after he was alive and back in heaven would not have happened. So Peter's going, what you are seeing is a prophecy being fulfilled, part prophecy being fulfilled about God saying, my spirit's going to come, you know, come down and rest on all these people. And then Peter saying, well, Jesus made that promise. And now you're seeing the promise fulfilled, which means Jesus didn't stay dead, which is what David did, which means or David prophesied, which means Jesus has risen from the dead and he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. So he's using all these things that they are very familiar with in saying, yeah, you're, what you're witnessing is the Holy Spirit that's come down because guess what? Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again and now he's in heaven. Just as David prophesied. 
piecing it all together. Now, he talks about a declaration and an accusation. In 36, he says this, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So after he's gone through all of this, I know I kind of missed a few verses. Let me read 32 through 36. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, bless you, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is, it's beautiful. You know, P- Peter isn't speaking because he's such an intelligent man. He's a fisherman, okay? Peter has not had time to go to seminary and do deep theological studies and study the Old Testament inside out and come up with an eloquent sermon. Peter stood up because the Holy Spirit said, stand up. And Peter spoke because the Holy Spirit said, speak these words and it'll make sense. And that's exactly what he's done. And to the hearers there, the Jews who are hearing this, they know this inside out. They know what they are listening to. They don't need any convincing and bless you. And the Holy Spirit is at work, right? But that declaration from Peter and the accusation, it's a double-edged sword really. There's a declaration, this Jesus is Lord and Christ, but the accusation is you crucified him. Now, he's finished, bless you, he's finished with that. Now listen to the response. See, if the Holy Spirit was doing all of this through Peter, then the Holy Spirit was also at work in the people who were listening. Because look what happens now. Now when they heard this, verse 37, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? So they were pierced to the heart. The Holy Spirit was at work in them. It wasn't like all of a sudden, Oh no, Peter, your words are so powerful. Now I see how terrible it was to crucify this Jesus Christ. My goodness, now I remember that picture. Oh my, oh so terrible. We are so heartbroken, so feeling terrible. No, it wasn't some emotional response. It wasn't bad feelings taking over. The Holy Spirit was at work, which kind of makes the whole point of the Holy Spirit coming down on the believers is one thing and the Holy Spirit being work at work in the lives of the unbelievers because it is the Holy Spirit who works in the heart of sinners to save them. Jesus did what he did and he promised the Holy Spirit would come down and guess what he did? He fulfilled his promise. We all have that Holy Spirit. The disciples had the Holy Spirit then and the Holy Spirit immediately starts moving. And through Peter has this wonderful summary of the gospel. And as the Holy Spirit alone can do, he pierces the heart of all the people who are listening. And they go, what should we do? The response to the work of the Holy Spirit when a sinner hears the gospel. That's that we are seeing basically a summary of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes when people believe. The disciples believed in Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes down. The Holy Spirit is in them. The Holy Spirit says, speak. Peter speaks and speaks only what the Holy Spirit wants him to speak. The people who are listening, remember, they heard, they came, and they listened. And the Holy Spirit was at work in them. And the Holy Spirit pierced their heart, causing a response The Holy Spirit wasn't using them as a puppet. The Holy Spirit pierced their heart and then there was a response. What shall we do? So there's belief, there's repent and be baptized. That's the process. Okay. So he says this, starting at verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If somebody says, 
describe Christianity in one sentence. There it is, right there. You've heard the message of the gospel. Now repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it raises an interesting point. I've come, come across Christians who've said, Oh, I haven't been baptized. You know, I just haven't found that right time. Just, you know, just didn't feel it. No, baloney. If you heard the gospel, and if the Holy Spirit worked in your heart, and He's actually caused you to say yes to Jesus, there is no reason on God's green earth that, shouldn't, that should prevent you from getting baptized. Because that's what Peter says here. He says, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. No doing this, no doing that, no doing ten steps, nothing. Believe, repent, receive. Then he goes on to say this in verse 39. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. So Peter just doesn't stop with them. He goes, it's not just for you. It's for everyone following you. Your family, all who are to come. I mean... If I'm standing there, my heart's been pierced because I was responsible partially with the rest of the people standing there for the crucifixion of the creator of the heavens and the earth. My Messiah, the one who came to save me, I put nailed to a two by four. I'm standing there. I've been pierced to the heart. Now I hear the first good news, which is repent and, you know, believe and be baptized in Jesus Christ and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yay. But then it doesn't just stop there. God is gracious. He goes further. It's for everyone. As the Lord calls. Listen to that. As the Lord our God will call to himself. Further attesting what Jesus speaks of. Which is the Holy Spirit. No one will come to be unless the Father calls. And the Father uses the Holy Spirit. I've said this before. You know people have said. Oh where does free will come in? And you know how does that work? And you know. Think of it this way. Can we draw the line where one ends and the other begins? No, I've always described it this way. It's the perfect marriage of God's Spirit working in a person and the free will He's given us, the response to Him. We don't know where one ends and the other begins, but both are at work because we see that right there. We don't need to explain the details of it, but we know that our God would not just stamp on our free will and say, you're going to be saved whether you like it or not. He doesn't do that. But nor does he say, I don't care, whatever. Well, I died. I did it. It was painful. Did you see that? Now it's all on you. Go figure it out. Go study for 10 years. Go around somewhere for 30 times and 10 times and you know meditate under a tree for 30 years. Maybe you will attain salvation. No, he doesn't. He's done it all. And not only that, He's given us His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is at work. It's been all cut down for us. We just need to obey. We, do, we need to, of course, have a personal relationship. And we just need to be led by Him. That's it. And that same Holy Spirit who came down all those thousands of years ago, 2,000 plus years ago, is still at work today in us and in the world. Now, I don't know about you. I'm glad. And then... Verse 40, And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. I think, no, not I think. I know Peter could actually be here today and given the same sermon, and that statement is just as true today as it was then. Be saved from this perverse generation. If there's a summary, as so someone says, Hey, why are you talking about Jesus all the time? We've got a summary up there. But then here's a pretty direct statement. Be saved from this perverse generation. You don't know if it is perverse? What rock have you been living under? Look around. How perverse is this world? Babies, innocent babies being killed. In the womb. No chance to defend themselves. The other week on social media, I read this uh, abortion provider, this woman. Ironically, her shirt said, Save the lives of women. You know? Protect the women. And she was an abortion provider. And you know what she said? She says, I can't hear babies scream because the first thing that I cut is the, the throat, the vocal cords. So uh, there is no screaming. 
this woman was on social media publicly writing these things. If that's not perverse, I don't know what is. And that's just something so obvious. God knows all the things that are going on behind closed doors. We are in a perverse generation and this generation needs Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit working in people just as much as 2,000 years ago. All those people needed it. And then verse 41 says, So then those who had received His word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Must have been quite a crusade. The Holy Spirit was working. They heard the word. They responded. And they were saved by God. And they were added to the church. And notice again, they were baptized. They didn't wait. It wasn't some long drawn process. Baptism is a step of obedience. That's all it is. But it's so much more. It is just as Jesus said, when John says, wait, you should be baptizing me. Why, why are you asking me to baptize you? I would have almost loved to see that in person. John's face where he goes, you're the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and you're asking me to baptize you? And Jesus says this, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. And that's what it is. Getting baptized, going under the water and coming back up is us saying that's what we are doing along with Christ, being raised to newness in life, but to fulfill all righteousness. If the Lord our God did it, and He says you should do it, then we do it. That's it. But if you go, well, you know, I, I really need to understand the theological implications and the supernatural elements and all of that. If anyone were to come to me and say that kind of stuff, I'd take him aside and go, what are you on about? Did you die for yourself? Are you the savior of the world? Who said you should receive any sort of explanation that somehow I or God's word has to justify to you that you need to obey his word? You either obey or you don't. If somebody says, I don't want to be baptized, it's disobedience. Just leave it at that. No need to explain any further. Because if God's word says it, we do it. End of story. Starting at verse 42, we now see the church walking in the Spirit. So then, oh sorry, verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So, steadfast or continually steadfast, the Greek root word proskarterio is to continue to do something with intense effort with the possible implication of despite difficulty. That means they were doing that. So we see, you know, when we read that they were continually, you know, we just don't see the depth of it. But we go to the Greek word, of course there was difficulties. You think everyone was like, oh wow, there goes a bunch of Christians. Yay! Let's cheer them on. No! They were basically telling people Jesus is the Messiah when not too long ago the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders had put him on a two by four. So you think that all those people would be just so happy for them to keep following in the way? No, they were not. So they were meeting together despite difficulty with intense dedication. Okay. Teaching. So it says here that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. The, te the word is didache or didache, however you pronounce it, is doctrine. And that's what they were studying. Doctrine. Not to become theological experts, they were studying truth. They were studying God's word. This, once again, I stress the importance of spending time in God's word. Because if the early church was doing that steadfastly, with great dedication, despite difficulty, nothing prevents us from doing that very thing today. Today we are gathered here as a church because guess what? That's what they were doing back then. Sure, there was no AC or anything like that, and nice couches maybe, but they were gathered together in homes like this, doing exactly what we are doing. And they did it despite difficulty with great dedication. Second Timothy three sixteen through seventeen 
and Hebrews 4 to 12, talking about the importance of God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You want to know how to be the kind of Christian that God wants you to be? Here it is. You've got the word, you've got the Holy Spirit, you've got everything that you need. Okay, don't be in the habit of forsaking spending time in God's word. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than to any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. When we spend time in God's word, relying on the Holy Spirit, to tell us, to teach us what God's Word says. He's going to do some surgery in us. All the way to the very heart of who we are. So that when He is done, and when it's all healed and ready to go, we are more like Jesus and less like what we were before. So much significance in spending time in God's Word. When I pray for all of you every day, that's one of the things that I pray without a fit. Irrespective of what your other prayer requests are, my prayer is that you would spend time in God's Word and in prayer. That's, if there's anything that you pray for anybody, if you pray for that as a fellow Christian, for a fellow Christian, that's a great prayer. If you don't know what else to pray for. Fellowship. Okay, it says, devoting themselves to apostles' teaching and to fellowship. The Greek word koinonia, what is shared in common as the basis of fellowship, which is partnership, community. That's what this is. We are more than just a church by name. We are a community. We are family. We may not be related by blood, but we are related by something far more powerful and more important and greater than that, which is Christ. Okay? Hebrews 10.25, 10.24-25 says this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's why we meet together, not just to listen to me. That's one small element of it. God's word is big, I'm small. But we also meet together so we can exhort one another, encourage one another, help one another, pray for one another, love one another, just as the Lord tells us to, commands us to. That's why we're here as a church. That's why we don't just meet um, on uh, Sundays, but we, we ought to fellowship as much as is reasonably possible. You know. So breaking of bread, prayer, they were selfless. Gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, favor with all people. And we see that as we read it. It says this, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. This is verse 43. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who, were, who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So we see that community at work. We pray together. They prayed together. And at that time, prayer would have been one of those things that sustained them more than anything else because they were being persecuted for following Jesus the way. Feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. That we know this because we see it further written in the, uh, in the New Testament were together and had all things in common. That's very important. If we are selfish, if we only think about ourselves, chances are we will miss what the Holy Spirit is telling us when someone else is in need, especially those within our community, within our kononia, within our church. Which is why spending time in the Word and in prayer and always thinking of others more than ourselves is a way to be in tune to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. Because trust me, He will go through great means and incredible supernatural ways to tell us when someone else is in need. Sometimes, sometimes, 
Now, I don't know if you have experienced this. You might be just going about your business, you know, God in your heart and just going about your business and all of a sudden you have a thought, a person uh, appear in your mind and no logical human thought process led to that face. But when that happens, when a thought happens like that, that is completely off the left field, as we say, don't ignore it. The safest response is prayer. Lifting that situation or that person and saying, Lord, I have no idea why I'm thinking of this person or this situation. But you do what needs to be done for the person. Let them know you are there. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Resolve the situation. And that's your obedience. God says in the word, I desire obedience more than sacrifice. If I tell you to do something, even if it is just a simple prayer, do it. Don't worry about the results or the details. And they began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. This is the Spirit of God at work. There were probably very rich Jews amongst the church and maybe not so well off Jews, but it didn't matter. It wasn't that those poor people or the poor believers are asking anything of the rich believers. They were being led by the Spirit. And we see further down how even though the Spirit was at work, that some people were not necessarily um, kosher. Yeah. But when the Spirit leads us, He will give us the grace, the strength and the wisdom to do that which someone else might need in their hour of need. Okay, But we have to be listening. We have to be obedient. That's on us. And that won't come just one off. It comes as we daily spend time in God's word and in prayer and drawing close to him. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Gladness and sincerity of heart. I don't know about you, but I want to be that kind of person every day. Have a glad and sincere heart brought about by the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter whether it's a Christian or a non-Christian. My relationship with God and His relationship with me is strong and He will lead me. Whether a person says this or that, whether a situation turns out this way or that, He gives me the grace. Um, last Sunday, I was supposed to fly out um, in the evening to arrive late in the night so I could go to work Monday morning. But uh, Jetstar decided to cancel my flight a couple of hours before I was supposed to fly out. So I had to book a flight for the next day. So I had to wake up at 3 in the morning to get the flight at 6, to go, you know, come here, drop the car off, then take the bus, go to QUT and then work through till 6 o'clock. I thought I was going to not make it because humanly possible, but as I looked from the outside to myself, my strength was not weaning. My, you know, I wasn't grumpy or angry or annoyed. I was the exact same person. And I know in my heart it was in me. There was not an ounce of me that said, man, good, not as unfit as I thought to be or as weak as I, no, it was God's grace because throughout the day I did not want those students seeing anything less than the best of what God can do through me. And he did not fail. And he will not fail us if we trust him, if we depend on him, if we rely on him, if we serve him with gladness and sincerity of heart that is brought about by his Holy Spirit. It's not a lot of work we have to do. We just have to surrender to the Holy Spirit who is God. And it says that God added to the fellowship. The Lord added to the fellowship as He was saving people. Our church may be small, but if we continue to draw nearer to Him, serve and bless one another, hear His leading, He will continue to save people and He will add to this fellowship as He sees fit. But we need to, while we are here together, we need to, of course, serve Him 
and serve one another. How is God going to bring any more people here? Why would He bring any more here if we are dropping the ball with just 12 people? How could He add more? If I'm dropping the ball with you, why would He add more? If we are dropping the ball with each other, He's going to say, Sorry, Sri. Sorry, folks. You haven't got the basics yet. So, I'm not saying we haven't. But let this be a reminder that if we do what the Lord wants us to do, for him and for each other, he will do whatever he wants to do with his church, this church. So then, we've gone through Acts 2. What do we do with the word? Two questions really. What is our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Because we see him at work in a powerful and tremendous way. So what is our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Do you, do we let Him lead us? Or do we rely on ourselves? Our experience, our knowledge, our insight, our, 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 our. Or do we go, oh you Lord, speak Lord, your servant is listening. Is that what we do? Or be quiet Holy Spirit, I've got this. I'll let you in when the time comes. No, it doesn't work. And then the other question is, what sort of a church are we? Do we make the church what we want it to be? Because of all the different churches we have seen or been in? Or do we let God work in us and use us to build His church the way He wants to? I can guarantee you that this church will not be like every other Calvary Chapel church. Not because we are so super awesome and we're going to do everything better. This church is this church. It may be a Calvary Chapel, but it is this church. It is still His church. And as we let Him work in us, He will make it a very unique church. Still His church, still our church, but one that blesses the community, blesses the people, and blesses whoever walks in through those doors. So those are my two questions as a takeaway. What is your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? And what kind of a church do we want to be? And how is that going to happen? Is it going to happen because we are so this way and that way? Or because point number one, our relationship with the Holy Spirit is so great that the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit working in us, will make us a church that He wants us to be. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit. Everything good that comes out of this mouth is because of Your Spirit at work and because of Your Word. And Lord, I acknowledge that and I humbly acknowledge that and I pray that uh, whatever you have chosen to speak to me and through me is edifying and strengthening and encouraging and challenging everyone who's listening to these words. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work in us, renew our mind, you know, help us to become more like you, Jesus, in every aspect of our lives, not just what other people see, but behind closed doors, when no one's looking, when no one's watching, when no one's listening. Continue to work in us, Holy Spirit, so we are more and more becoming like Jesus. And help us as a church to be the church you want us to be. Because when our relationship individually is great with you, we know, Lord, that you can use us to make this the church you want it to be. Because it is your church. Calvary Chapel Brisbane is your church. We are your people and we don't want it any other way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.